Good afternoon. Um, many years ago, <coughs> excuse me, as a uh, young researcher uh, interested in Africa, I read uh, Kapuczynski's book, The Emperor, about the uh, demise of the Haile Selassie, of Haile Selassie as the emperor of, um, of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Hosni Mubarak had read it, uh, but he certainly could have benefited enormously from it. I certainly did, and uh, it left a, um, a sort of lasting impression of my, my understanding of the nature of power and the nature of political change. So from that perspective, it is a particular privilege for me to, uh, to be here today uh, to talk to you about issues that I'm keenly interested in. Uh, and which I think are of crucial importance to the world we're living in. I do um, about climate change and development, about two of the large global challenges that we are collectively facing, how to deal with global poverty, how to deal with, uh, with climate change. I, I could have titled it uh, uh, Between Ahmed in Kibaha and the G20, I'll, and I'll come back to uh, the meaning of, uh, of that. Uh, but just a quick quote to set the stage uh, from Lord Nicholas Stone. Poverty and climate change are the two great challenges of our century. Our responses to them will define our generation. And they are closely interlinked. Uh, let me start in Kibaha. Uh, those are three ladies, uh, but I prefer to talk about Ahmed in Kibaha. Uh, he is a man in his, uh, the best period of his life. He has uh, six live a wife and six live children. Two have already died. His wife is pregnant with a new one. He earns his living primarily as a small-scale farmer. Uh, but he lives at the outskirts of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. He also lives at the outskirts of the Kibaha Forest Reserve, uh, set up by the Tanzanian government with assistance from donors uh, many years ago. And of course, he is constantly faced with the challenge, how is he going to feed his family? How is he going to try and give his children a better life than what uh, his parents and he had? For that, he needs money. Uh, and there are two basic ways he could do it. He can expand his farm. That means cutting forest, moving into the forest reserve to cultivate. Or he can join the very lucrative uh, charcoal trade. Since, since Kapuczynski uh, watched Dar es Salaam from the rooftop of Twiga Hotel, the small city of half a million people has grown into a major city of between four and five million people. And of course, the demand for energy has increased uh, in the same way. And that's his choice. And unless we can influence collectively through global collective action, the framework within which he makes his decisions, he will continue to cut trees in order to grow food and in order to earn money. Ahmed wants to improve his life. And uh, 11 years ago, uh, 189 global leaders met in New York and agreed on the framework within which that could happen, uh, what we now refer to as the, as the, the MDGs. Uh, the, the goals that uh, uh, we collectively, uh, as a world uh, through actions by governments in developing countries, through actions by our governments in terms of resources, and through global collective actions by establishing a better global framework for development that we should, uh, these are the targets that we were planning to reach. Sometimes we create the image that we're not making progress in our global fight against poverty. And, I, and that is not true. I mean, we are, actually make, we, have, we are actually making enormous progress in the global fight against poverty. Uh, we might even reach the targets in terms of overall reduction in global poverty level. 
And I think it's fair to say that possibly for the first time in history, there is a real possibility that you could see the eradication of massive global poverty. For the first time in history, that is a real possibility. It will not happen automatically. Uh, it will happen only if developing countries uh, improve policies, if we agree on a better global framework, and if we provide resources, uh, because resources are also needed. Uh, because this is just, just sort of the uh, putting aid in context, you could say. This is the, the sort of overall resource transfer from uh, rich to poor countries. And of course, it is not only about aid, and that's, don't uh, bother too much about the figures here. Uh, but for one who's been working with development cooperation for a long time, it's important to, to give the message that development, I mean, development is not only about financing. It's about good policies nationally and globally, uh, and development financing is not only about aid. But saying that is not to say that aid is not important. It's not to say that the fact that in 2010, in spite of the global economic crisis, uh, ODA levels reached their historic peak at a close to 130 billion US dollars, uh, still substantially short of uh, the global ambitions of 0.7% of, of GNI, but still their highest level ever. Uh, whether we'll manage uh, in the uh, current budgetary environment in many of our member countries to maintain that track record. There was an increase of 6.5% 6, 6 from 2009 to 2010. What I, I think uh, it will be tough uh, to maintain that level of, of increase, but uh, still it is a substantial source of development financing. Um, yeah, just, just our, uh, our ranking list in absolute numbers. Of course, then we have an alternative ranking list in GNI per capita, where there are five countries who have constant, consistently exceeds the global target and some big countries who are far from reaching it. Uh, but while poverty is being reduced globally, we also see that the enormous changes that's happening in the world is you could say that it's changing also the geography of poverty. Uh, our, our image of poverty is of a poor person living in a poor country. That is, and, and, and particularly in a rural area in a poor country. And that is radically changing. The typical poor today lives in a middle income country. Actually close, according to Sumner's calculations, about 70% of the poor in the world no live in middle income countries. And that, so, so we're moving towards a situation where the typical poor is, lives in a middle income country in a city. He, many poor people still live, live in fragile states, but a typical poor does not. He lives in a sort of moderately stable middle income country. Of course, the, the question of the role of international transfer in relation to that uh, becomes more complex than in the past. Uh, because uh, what we are seeing is that this is this, what I've shown is the picture of the, the old world, you could say. Of, this was the new world with, with the, with the uh, new middle income countries. Because the new world is also reflected in development financing because, and we don't know exactly how much the not so new new providers of development financing are providing. Uh, Chinese aid celebrated its 50th anniversary last year, so it's not, it's not all that new. Uh, estimates differ from, but somewhere between 20, in addition to the, the 130 billion that uh, OECD DAC members provide, uh, the new emerging economies probably provide somewhere between 20 and 50 billion dollars in development financing who are uh, which is concessional in some way or, or the other. The figures and estimates differ, but it's a substantial new addition, which, of course, reflects that we are living in a, in a radically changing world. Uh, and uh, 
one of the expressions of that change is, of course, the fact that uh, uh, development is now high on the agenda also of the, the G20, and I'll revert to the G20 later on, since the G20 is the, the closest we have for the time being to a forum for, collect, for global collective decision-making on, on major issues until somebody manages to fix the UN and uh, the Security Council membership to make that reflect a new, uh, new reality and uh, that may be, still be some time, um, it may still say, take some time before we're there. Uh, so, that's development. Uh, and of course one of the consequences of the fact that many countries are succeeding in development is that the threat to the global climate is increasing because it isn't any longer only us from the rich countries who are increasing emissions by driving cars, spend, using more energy, uh, eating, more, eating more meat and fish, uh, not, only, not only grains. Uh, a rapidly growing middle class in, middle income, in, in the emerging economies are copying our lifestyles and our production models. So that the fact that new countries are succeeding in development, of course, is uh, pose an additional threat to, to climate. Uh, and that's part of the link uh, between climate and one dimension of the link between climate change and, uh, and development, but by, by no means the only one. Uh, le let me just, since I'm going to, to focus primarily on the, the sort of interaction between development and, and finance, just sort of state the obvious first, that, of course, uh, Dealing with climate change is not primarily the job of the developing world. It is primarily our responsibility. Uh, so just having said that, but I'm not, I, I'm not going to talk anything more about fossil fuel subsidies and other things in our part of the world which are uh, enormously important for our chances of success in, in relation to climate change, but focus on the interface with, uh, with development. Um, uh, and they are closely interlinked. Uh, this is what we've promised in Copenhagen and Cancun in order to help developing countries do their share of the deal. We have promised that we would provide uh, an average of 10 billion US dollars per year in the short run and an average of $100 billion uh, per year in the long run, and that we will help uh, establishing, establishing a green climate fund in order to manage a substantial part of it. Uh, there's a big difference between the two since the first, the short-term target is primarily related to public finance. The longer-term target clearly is clearly stated as a mixture of... Uh, of different sources of finances. Uh, there is a question of additionality, uh, which I'll revert to. Um, don't need to read it, and the point here is not, it's not state of play. A large number of funds are, have been established, are being established. Uh, so we are creating a a global climate finance industry uh, with uh, a large number of players, a large number of funding mechanisms, uh, and our capacity to track what's happening is not all that great. But what we do know is that climate change finance is increasing. Uh, there are different ways of measuring this. This figures is based on what we call the Rio Marcus, which is a, a system for assessing which part of OECD member countries' development assistance have climate change as an important part of their objective. And using that measure, uh, we see substantial increase. Uh, we are still working to capture more. Uh, if we look at uh, the uh, existing funds, uh, we see that uh, 
we have collectively pledged about what we promised as in short-term financing. Um, the 30 billion are sort of in terms of pledges, the 30 billion US dollars uh, of the three-year period is largely there. Uh, we see that we have uh, managed to uh, actually uh, make available only a third of that in terms of depositing it in, in funds. Uh, and we see that only a small fraction have been used. Uh, I'll revert to that. That's not, not all of that is a bad sign. I mean, it, those of us who've been involved in development for some time know that it takes time uh, to build capacity uh, to plan good activities that deserves funding. So uh, spending a lot of money quickly isn't necessarily always the best solution to, uh, to a problem. Um, just to sort of show that uh, the geography of receiving climate change financing is very different from the geography of receiving traditional development uh, assistance. And, as, uh, and, and that we are seeing, uh, as you see here clearly, middle-income countries being much better positioned to benefit from, uh, from the resources made uh, available for, uh, for climate change financing. Uh, the finance, special financing made available to uh, reduce deforestation, of course, will have a again a very different geography, largely reflecting uh, where the big forest resources are, uh, but also some odd cases out like Zambia and Tanzania, which as a Norwegian I can say I guess largely reflect the fact that some of us managed to convince the Norwegian government, who is a major funder of the Red Initiative, that uh, tropical forest was not only about rainforest but also about dryland forest. So that's I've already mentioned this, I think, uh, the use of the markers, which is sort of, for the time being, the best tool we have globally for following what resources, money, is actually being spent on uh, climate-related uh, climate uh, activities. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think I'll, uh, in just sort of, this is just the calculation of the, well, the, the uh, Meles uh, Brown panel, which became the Meles Stoltenberg uh, panel, which uh, uh, at the mandate of the UNSG uh, came up with ideas about how uh, the hundred billion dollars per year in the longer run could be could be possibly raised, showing that it is actually possible, uh, but it's uh, only possible uh, with a combination of of sources, and I think that is the, perhaps the most important part of it. It's only possible if we manage to reinvent the way we use public resources and manage to use public resources to leverage uh, private resources in a very different manner from what we have been able to do in traditional development cooperation. So I think that is the the one of the main messages from uh, from the uh, from the uh, from 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 our work so far on 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 uh, the the longer term financing is this then new and additional as we promised in uh, in Copenhagen uh, uh, we have no globally agreed definition of what new and additional means. And uh, uh, when we did an analysis of this a few months back, we came across in active use, in active use, uh, at least five, these five different uh, ways of defining what new and additional means. Uh, new sources of finance, additional to existing climate financing, uh, committed in Copenhagen, additional to climate financing in 29, additional to existing aid volumes and commitments, additional to the 0.7 targets. Uh, and we see that different countries have different interpretations of, um, of this. Uh, politically, 
This is, of course, important in measuring how we are uh, following up uh, Copenhagen. Uh, substantively, uh, I think it is very important to, to remember that the degree of overlap between both adaptation efforts and substantive part of climate change mitigation, be that in, uh, in, uh, in forest conservation, be that in energy supply, implies that to, to try to draw a boundary between climate change financing and development financing will be largely impossible. Oops. Just uh, the, another area where we have done a lot of effort uh, over the past decade is in the health sector. And this is, uh, you could say, is the aggregate result of our effort, seen from uh, the perspective of a country uh, who has got to manage this multitude of players and initiatives uh, and make that into a coherent approach to, um, to its health sector. And I, I, I show this because I see a real danger that we are moving in this direction also when it comes to climate, that the, the number of initiatives, the number of players will create a, a context which will be extremely difficult for, uh, for developing countries to, uh, to manage. Uh, I'll move quickly through this. Just, these are some of the lessons that we have learned from 50 years of development cooperation about what works and what doesn't work. And I think one of the main messages we try to give uh, on climate change financing these days is don't forget about these lessons. Remember that these are the ways we've learned that if we focus on national ownership, on national leadership, if we try to use country systems, if we try to harm harmonize and coordinate, then the chances of uh, getting results from our money increased sub increase substantially. Uh, I'll just... Uh, uh, and then... It isn't all about money. Money is important, but it isn't all about money. And I, I hope sort of pouring money into forest activities in DRC without strengthening systems, both to plan, to implement, and to account for, won't make much difference. So that there is, a, there is both a real challenge on our side in terms of the type of architecture we put in place. But of course, there is also the challenge of capacity, capacity, capacity. Local capacity, local capacity, local capacity. Um, and uh, do we, in the development of climate as a major issue, as, and as a major issue in, in, uh, develop, in the development discourse also, do we see uh, the emergence of a new way of thinking about resource transfer? I mean, traditionally, resource transfers from rich to poor countries has been based on solidarity, on humanitarianism. Do we see the emergence of a new way of thinking where uh, dealing with common challenges, dealing with financing ecosystem services, financing global public goods becomes at least a much more important and maybe even a dominating uh, justification for, for global resource transfers in the future. Uh, is the world ready to make the radical decisions that will be needed in order to make Durban a success? I wish I knew. <coughs> uh, my, I think, as a, f for that to happen, uh, to uh, the rich countries must move out of their traditional framework, and the not so poor, and not any longer so poor countries will have to move out of the G77. Uh, framework. We need to recognize that we have a new world with a new alignment of countries, with a new way of sharing both 
problems and responsibilities. And if we don't manage to do that, we will not succeed. In the global architecture at present, I, with all its weaknesses, I see the G20 as the closest we have to an arena with a potential capacity of making those type of global decisions of leading in that type of, uh, of global collective action. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, political environments in uh, many rich countries are not particularly favorable for, for the time being, but uh, that type of political leadership is needed. So, returning to Ahmed in Kibaha, the big question is, will we collectively be able to make decisions which makes it more profitable for him when he is going to decide how can he finance his, the education of his children, how can he make sure that his wife, uh, the delivery of their ninth child, uh, hopefully seventh live child, happens in a uh, good health facility. Can we manage collectively to create a framework which means that in order to do that, he would decide to conserve the forest rather than to cut the trees for agriculture or for fuel wood. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>